I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to our inaugural lecture in the Vanderbilt Nobel Memorial Lecture Series, which is organized around the theme of science in the service of society. I'm Bob Scher, the chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy, and today's lecture is sponsored jointly by the Department of Physics and Astronomy, the Vanderbilt Law School, and Dyer Observatory. The lecture series honors Vanderbilt alumni and faculty who have received the Nobel Prize, and I just wanted to briefly tell you who those were in case you don't know them. Uh, in chronological order, Max Delbruck shared the 1969 Nobel Prize for Medicine and Physiology for his studies of viruses. He was a faculty member in the Department of Physics and Astronomy from 1940 to 1947, when he did much of his important work in this field. Uh, he worked actually in Buttrick Hall, and there's a plaque over there at the side of his laboratory if you'd like to see it. Earl Sutherland received the 1971 Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology for his discoveries concerning the mechanisms for the action of hormones. He was professor of physiology in the Vanderbilt Medical School from 1963 until 1973, and of course, Vanderbilt Sutherland Prize for Research is named after him. Stanley Cohen was the 1986 Nobel Laureate in Medicine or Physiology for his discovery of epidermal growth factor. He joined the Vanderbilt Biochemistry Department in the medical school in 1959 and retired in 2000. Mohamed Yunus shared the 2006 Nobel Peace Prize for his pioneering work with microcredit and he received his PhD in economics from Vanderbilt in 1969. And finally, Al Gore shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize with our speaker today and his co-workers. Uh, he, Al Gore attended both the Divinity School and the Law School at Vanderbilt. And now I'd like to introduce Rick Chappell, the director of Dyer Observatory, who is going to introduce our speaker. Welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to get to introduce my good friend Richard Somerville. Richard is a distinguished professor emeritus at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California in San Diego. I had the privilege of uh, working with Richard about 20 years ago to found the Aspen Global Change Institute. Richard is an amazing scientist and an amazing communicator. He did his undergraduate work at Penn State University in meteorology and his PhD at New York University in meteorology. Richard's career has taken him to most of the major institutions in America that are involved in, in global climate change research. Uh, he's held research and leadership positions at the National Center for Atmospheric Research and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and now at the University of California at San Diego. His research is on the physics of clouds and the role that clouds play in the climate system. He's interested in all aspects of climate research and as a theoretical meteorologist, works in climate modeling and weather prediction uh, and atmospheric modeling. He's the author of more than 150 research papers and he has an award-winning book um, the Forgiving Air, Understanding Environmental Change. And Richard, in fact, has, will be a, around after the, uh, the program to, to sign books if you would like to visit with him in the lobby. Um, he's received numerous honors in his career, including being a uh, fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the American Meteorological Society. Um, he is, uh, this past year, and really over the past several years, worked as a coordinating lead author on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Fourth Assessment Report, which was, uh, as Bob mentioned, which shared the Nobel Prize uh, in 2007. Richard is a dedicated scientist who enjoys working with teachers of science and enjoys communicating science, at which he's exquisitely good. Please join me in welcoming Richard Somerville. I'd like to thank uh, Rick Chappell for those kind words and the Physics and Astronomy Department, the Law School, the Observatory for sponsoring this lecture. I'm deeply honored to be the first lecturer in this series, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming. I'm going to uh, spend less than an hour and leave some time for questions, and I want to do uh, 
several things. I'd like to update you with a thumbnail sketch of the current status of climate change theory. Uh, what do we know, what don't we know about global warming? I'd like then to go on to the policy issue uh, to talk about uh, what the world is contemplating doing about it, how science uh, can speak uh, to that issue. And I uh, also want to talk to you about the organization that's been mentioned a couple of times already, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that I've been privileged to work with for the last three years, uh, producing a major report that's an assessment of current climate change uh, science. So that's the, that's the plan. Um, it's considered bad taste at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where I'm from, not to show this graph, um, which is the most famous graph in Earth science. It's the, entirely the work of one scientist, Charles David Keeling, who died three years ago, who spent his life measuring atmospheric carbon dioxide. And one could talk a long time about the significance of this graph, and I'll have a few words to say about Dave Keeling, who was a personal friend um, at the end of the talk. But the important thing to note is, first of all, there's no controversy about this graph. The people who think there's something wrong with this and that atmospheric carbon dioxide isn't going up and it's not, the rise isn't caused by humans are the same kinds of people who uh, don't believe in anything scientific. So this, this is rock solid science. Keeling invented the instrument as a young postdoctoral fellow in the 1950s and started these measurements. He put his instrument in Hawaii because it was a pristine location. And you can see on this graph, at the lower left, the amount of carbon dioxide in 1958 in these units was 315. And that translates to if you took a million molecules of, of the air, randomly chosen from clear, unpolluted air, 315 of those million would be, uh, <coughs> would be carbon dioxide molecules, CO2, a perfectly um, uh, innocuous, colorless, odorless, tasteless, non-toxic gas that bubbles in champagne and beer and soda pop. And uh, we know also from uh, air trapped in ice cores that uh, before the Industrial Revolution, say in mid-19th century, the number was 280. So between 280 in the 19th century, 315 when Keeling started, and today, as you can see in the upper right on this graph, the number is somewhat above 380 on annual average. And so if you think about the implications of that, there's been a 35% rise in the atmospheric amount of carbon dioxide uh, in the last 150 years or so. And uh, the rise is entirely human caused. There's no doubt about that. And the main cause in the rise is the burning of fossil fuels. Every time we combust coal or oil or natural gas or their products to uh, make energy, to drive a car, to heat a house, to run a power plant, carbon dioxide goes out the chimney or the tailpipe or the smokestack. It's a natural, inevitable byproduct of combustion. And uh, that's responsible for the bulk of the rise. Deforestation is a secondary cause. When you chop down a tree and burn it or let it decay, the carbon goes back into the, into the air. And there are so several smaller causes too, but the rise is entirely uh, man-made. Another way of saying it is that in the air today, better than three out of four molecules of carbon dioxide are there because we put them there. All, all of us, our six and a half billion friends around the world and their, their parents and grandparents put these things in the atmosphere. So whatever you uh, choose to uh, accept or not about climate change, the fact that the human race has uh, had a profound influence on the chemical composition of the atmosphere is not arguable. That's just a fact. And I'll show you some more examples of that. It's interesting, by the way, um, there, this data is so good, the instrument Keeling built is, is so accurate that you can see things like El Ninos come and go, that affects the rate at which CO2 is taken up by the ocean. You can see the Arab oil embargo in the 1970s, which was a temporary slowing down in the use of, of coal and oil. And you can also see this uh, uh, very periodic rising and falling of the curve every year. This curve to the, to the naked eye has two big features. One is it goes up, and uh, with time, and the other is that there's a rise and fall every year. And Keeling discovered the cause of that as well. It's the, the breathing of the biosphere, to put it poetically. It's the fact that trees and other plants on land take in carbon dioxide in, when they photosynthesize in the spring and turn it into tree or plant material, and they give it back in the fall when the trees respire and the leaves fall off. It follows the northern hemisphere seasons because most of the land and most of the trees and plants are there. So in this one simple graph, you have uh, 
unimpeachable evidence both of the connection between the world of living things, the biosphere, and the physical climate system, and you also have uh, an effect of human activity that's, that's impressive, that's uh, undeniable, and that's, that's very real. This is a set of graphs from the IPCC report. The IPCC is a funny organization. It uh, was formed in 1988 under UN auspices. It has thus 20 years of experience, during which time it's put out four big assessment reports in 1990, 95, 2001, and 2007. They are known, uh, with all the imagination and creativity that characterizes scientific reports, as the first, second, and third, and fourth assessment reports. And uh, the fourth one is the one that came out in 2007. That's the one I'll be talking about. And uh, the uh, report comes in three parts. Two parts I won't be speaking to. They deal with how to adapt to climate change and how to mitigate climate change. The first part deals with the physical science of climate change. It's a thousand page book. You can, can buy it uh, in the bookstore. You can get it for free on the internet. I'll tell you how later on. And there's a 20 page summary of it that was negotiated word for word uh, by the governments of the world in a plenary in Paris early last year. And it has a half a dozen figures and I'm going to show you those figures. This is the first one, and you can see uh, that you're looking at several measures of uh, climate change. Uh, here is, uh, on the top panel, is global average temperature from 1850 on the left to the present. You can see there was a rise in early 20th century, a slight cooling between the 1940s and the 1970s globally. We think that was due to um, a polluted air in that period before there was the Clean Air Act and its analogs in other countries and a very rapid market rise in the last three or four decades. Uh, here, the black line is a running average. The circles are individual years. The blue band is thicker in the past when it's a measure of the uncertainty or, or possible error. This is sea level rise. Sea level is a, a, a remarkable uh, effect of climate change. During the ice ages, when a lot of uh, water was uh, tied up in ice on land, and, a lot of, and the water in the ocean took up a smaller volume because it was cooler, the sea level was 100 meters, upwards of uh, 300 feet, lower than today. You can see that from geological evidence. So it's not going to rise 100 meters um, because you're driving your car to work, but it is rising. And uh, it rose during the 20th century at about uh, seven inches over the century, and it's still rising today. Again, you, you see this record here. The, the uh, record up to here is taken from floats uh, at uh, measuring stations on coastlines. And uh, this red line here is uh, satellite altimetry, which is the later and be better way to do it. So the world is warming. Sea level is going up, which we would expect. Snow cover is, is going down. We have good snow cover records since the 1930s, and you can see the decrease. Um, the uh, IPCC report stopped with science at about summer of 2006 in general. So the rapid uh, uh, loss of Arctic sea ice uh, last year and this year is uh, not part of the report. At the same time that the climate is changing, the science of climate is changing too. And this is a cartoon uh, showing how climate models, the computer simulations that are one of the tools we use to understand the climate system better, have evolved. In the mid-1970s on the upper panel, uh, computer models were very simple. These are very like the models that are used to forecast the weather. They, have, they predict the pressure, temperature, winds, humidity at a bunch of grid points around the world. And, uh, except that they're coupled to models of the ocean and the land and so on now. But at the beginning, it was a simple weather-like model with a, with a water cycle that made rain, and the amount of carbon dioxide was just put in as a variable. Carbon dioxide affects the greenhouse effect. We'll talk about that. By the mid-1980s, uh, the model, uh, models had evolved somewhat, and you can see uh, the, there was a, a rudimentary attempt to take into account the effects of clouds on climate and other things. I'm not going to read this graph to you, except to point out the interesting nomenclature here. The first assessment report of IPCC is known in the trade as the, the FAR, pronounced FAR. The second one in, in 1995, the SAR. The third one in 2001, the TAR. Am I going too fast? And then <laughs> the one last year, we figured out that we couldn't call the fourth assessment report the FAR because we already used it uh, before. So it's known in the trade as AR4 but uh, in, a, in a wonderful tribute to historical authenticity. They didn't go back and rename these AR1, 2, and, and, and 3. 
So, but in uh, laughter aside, I want to stress that one of the remarkable things about this story is that during this unique time, when for the first time in human history, we are making uh, big changes in the environment. We're changing, as I've said, the chemical composition of the atmosphere for starters, and much follows from that. At the same time, almost serendipitously, almost by happenstance, our ability to study these phenomena re was revolutionized. And uh, I first went to college in 1958 to study meteorology, so that's a half a century of experience. In 1958, there were no satellites. The computers, uh, the biggest, most powerful computers of the world had vacuum tubes, and they were a whole lot less potent than this laptop. And uh, we, were, we were really ill-equipped to study the science of climate change. And in the same time as the climate itself has been evolving, due to both natural and, and human-caused factors, our ability to do the science has changed. So that in, in my uh, professional career, I've seen a huge revolution. Climatology today is exciting. We get uh, cream of the crop grad students who come study it. Climatology, when I started out, was a dull scientific backwater. You, you wrote down today's weather observations on a, uh, on a punched card and mailed it into uh, some cave somewhere, and it never came out. It was a black hole for data. And, uh, and so the, the science itself has changed remarkably. And you could speculate about what a world would be like in which we used fossil fuels, as the present world has, but failed to invent uh, satellites and electronic computers. Here's an example of what the computer has done for us. This, for you techie people, is Moore's Law at work. This is the grid resolution. You, you compute uh, these things by dividing the world up into grid squares. And for the FAR, close to 20 years ago, uh, the ALPS was about two grid boxes. As computers get faster, you can afford to put, make the grid boxes smaller. This is known in the trade as improving the horizontal resolution. And you can see um, the enormous change, the ability to resolve smaller and smaller features, and also to solve more accurately the basic equations. This is Newtonian physics. This is conservation of energy and mass and momentum and so on. And as I said, the variables are largely the weather variables, temperature, pressure, wind, humidity, except the models are run for simulated decades instead of just to predict tomorrow's uh, weather. So th there's been a revolution in the technology, computational technology, observational technology, and also in the theoretical understanding that goes into these computer simulations, some results of which I'll show you right now. Um, here's uh, another figure uh, from the plenary. This, this is the summary for policymakers. Um, you're looking here in these three figures at the rise in temperature observed in the black line globally, over land only globally, and over the whole global ocean. And in the other six figures, you're looking at the same thing over the six inhabited continents. You can see, first of all, that the, uh, the rise is uh, everywhere. Uh, all the continents are warming in recent decades. In some areas like North America, which was especially polluted in the uh, post-war decades, you see this steeper drop in, uh, in cooling uh, in the mid, uh, from the 40s into the 70s. Uh, this tells you a lot of things right away. Uh, first of all, it's not the urban heat island effect. The warming is not an artifact of temperatures being in hot cities that got bigger and warmer, because there aren't any cities in the ocean, and it's warming uh, too, less than the land, because the heat's distributed uh, below the surface. But uh, there are many other aspects of this that's good. One of the statements in the IPCC report is that the, the warming is unequivocal. To give you an idea of what these plenaries are like, there's simultaneous interpretation in the six UN languages and full parliamentary procedure, and a bunch of uh, delegates who are willing to spend a lot of time deciding whether we could say unequivocal or evident. Is the warming evident, or is the warming unequivocal? There was actually a delegate from a country in, for which French was one of the languages, but he wasn't French. This was taking place in Paris, who said, we couldn't say unequivocal because there's no word in French for unequivocal. It had to say evident. This was in Paris, in the shadow of the Eiffel Tower, next door to the school where Napoleon learned military science. And this assault on the sacred French language did not go unanswered by the French delegate. So it, it came out unequivocal. The pink and the blue areas here are uh, the results of computer simulations trying to simulate the evolution of the 20th century climate, you might say, um, under two sets of assumptions. In the blue ones, the assumption is the computer model was fed with the instructions take into account in computing the evolution of the climate 
things that are natural, like the variability of the sun. The sun varies a little bit, a tenth of a percent in intensity over the 11-year solar cycle. Take into account known large volcanic eruptions, because they're known to cool the planet for a few years temporarily. But leave out the human-caused factors, like the rise in carbon dioxide, which strengthens the greenhouse effect. And when you do that, all the computer models produce results that fall into the blue area here. They all miss the, uh, the ubiquitous rise in temperature uh, from uh, two-thirds of the way through the 20th century till today. So the blue simulations are what the climate would have done to the best of the computer model's ability to simulate it had there been only natural factors at play, the factors that have always been there and that have caused climate change in the distant past. The pink areas are the result of further instructing the computer models to go back, recompute the 20th century climate, but this time, this time, include the increase in the greenhouse effect due to the rise of carbon dioxide and several other gases that also trap heat, act as a blanket, make the atmosphere more opaque in the infrared. And as you can see, the pink areas with the human factors included, pollution particles as well, by the way, uh, all capture uh, the observed rise. So in, in a nutshell, this says that to the best of the ability of current science, never perfect, always evolving, we can't account for the observed warming that has occurred, the single most fundamental climate parameter you can think of, the average temperature, uh, without taking into account the human cause strengthening of the greenhouse effect. Uh, this is a statement. The IPCC uh, not only writes a thousand-page report every five or six years, and not only puts out a 20-page summary for policymakers of it, but also compresses the whole effort into a sentence or two for the benefit of those with short attention spans or early deadlines. And this is the headline statement in 1995. If this looks like it was negotiated by a bunch of diplomats, it was. Um, in the same way that unequivocal versus evident was negotiated. The balance of evidence suggests a discernible human influence on global climate. The first IPCC report, the FAR, in 1990, um, had an even weaker uh, statement, basically said, uh, this is a matter of concern, we have to keep watching it, not likely to be detected for quite a while yet. By 2001, however, this is the TAR, uh, there is new and stronger evidence that most of the warming observed over the last 50 years is attributable to human activity. These statements, like everything else that comes out of the summary for policymaker plenaries, is unanimously approved by all governments. If any government, yours or any other, chose to dug in its heel and say, we cannot accept that word, it doesn't go in there. So this is, these things are drafted by the scientists, a very interesting interaction drafted by the scientists, and the scientists are there, the heads of the chapters of the report, of whom I was one in, the a in AR4, the last report, were present at the plenary. We were there to answer questions, to be on the podium when our section of the report was being wordsmithed, but we didn't ever lose control of the scientific content of the report. The delegates actually, for the first work working group, for the physical science part, acted constructively, and I think it's fair to say uh, we're not foot dragging and we're simply anxious to couch the report in terms that will be most intelligible and most useful and relevant to the intended audience, which are senior policymakers, the Condoleezza Rices of the world. Um, so that's the report from uh, 2001. And then this year, in a radical break with uh, tradition, we issued two headline statements instead of one. You just see the quaking there. Um, warming of the climate system is unequivocal. And let me tell you, there's a lot of other thought that went into a lot of these other words, too, as is now evident from lots of factors. Global average air and ocean temperatures are going up. Snow and ice are melting, widespread, and there's global average sea level is rising, among other things. That was one of the headline statements. And the second one is uh, this one here. Most, I've been asked to define that in some other audiences, I'll, let, I'll tell you most means 50% or more. Can we agree on that? Most of the observed increase in globally average temperatures since mid 20th century is very likely and this is coded, calibrated language. Very likely means chances 9 out of 10 or better in expert judgment that this is true. Is very likely due to the observed increase in anthropogenic, that means human cause, greenhouse gas concentrations, that means amounts. Um, this, these statements, the summary for policymakers, the full report, um, the uh, summary for policymakers in lots of other languages, a set of frequently asked questions, some supplementary material, is all available free for nothing at the IPCC website, and I commend it to you.
This is a very striking figure from this summary because it goes back 10,000 years. What you're looking at here in each of these figures is uh, a 10,000 year stretch of time. On the left, in each figure is 10,000 years ago, and on the right is today. This top figure is carbon dioxide. The middle one is methane. The lower one is nitrous oxide. They're methane is essentially natural gas. And nitrous oxide is a product of uh, many processes, especially agricultural processes. And this says that 10,000 years ago, and for uh, several millennia following, carbon dioxide amounts uh, ranged in these same units uh, before around 250, 280, sort of in that range. And then starting in the 19th century, this rapid rise, which is blown up in the inset figure here, has risen up to the present value of 380 plus, an increase of roughly 100 of these, these units. Keeling's data are the red line here, and they graphed right onto these paleo data. You might ask why Keeling having been absent 10,000 years ago, we know what the concentration was, and it's a remarkable piece of scientific detective work and good blind dumb luck. We know it only because there is air trapped, fossil air from long ago, trapped in ice in Greenland and Antarctica. Each year in Greenland and Antarctica, ice is formed as the weight of this year's snowfall compresses previous year's snowfall, and tiny bubbles of ice containing the air at the time when the ice was formed are, are compressed, and the technology now is so slick, this is fairly recent technology, that you can core, that is drilled deeply into these, uh, into these ice sheets, kilometers thick, pull up a cylinder of ice, date it, crush the ice in sterile conditions in the lab, and analyze these tiny bubbles of air for how much CO2 and methane and nitrous oxide they had. If we didn't have the luck of having the ice cores and the smarts of knowing how to analyze them, we had no other way of knowing what the, you, you might say, the, uh, the, pa the paleo concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere was. But this tells you that not only for CO2, but uh, for the other gases as well, there was something like a near equilibrium with slow variation and, and small variability over millennia. Uh, followed by a rapid rise in, in recent decades. So it was further evidence of, of, uh, of human activity. Uh, I've put this in. It's a famous um, document among physicists especially. Um, you, it, this is an actual sign that stood for a while outside Aspen, Colorado. And you notice that the arithmetic is impeccable. If you add this number of years and that number of feet and that many people, you do get this number. You show this to graduate students to, in, to, and actually to others too, to uh, make, impress upon them uh, that it's not good to add apples and oranges. And uh, you can get mistakes that way. And that's true in climate science too. Let's see. I'm losing control of the computer. Good. Computer is frozen. Curse you, Bill Gates. This is a Macintosh. This isn't supposed to happen. Okay, I, I may have to reboot the computer. I don't know how else to get out of this. Hmm. Yeah, I know how to force quit. See, that's how you force quit. Yeah, I do. Okay, and now we'll relaunch it and hope that it behaves better. I wasn't trying to say anything bad about laptop computers. Um, <coughs> but at any rate, uh, to guard against this, uh, this flaw in the, uh, in the arithmetic, what IPCC has done, the scientific research community has done, all IP IPCC has, is, is just a group of a few hundred scientists assessing the published peer-reviewed technical research literature and coming to an informed judgment about its significance. And uh, IPCC doesn't itself do any research. It doesn't have any money. It doesn't have any staff. It's, it just organizes the process by which these reports are written, which, by the way, was policy neutral. There was no pressure on us. I never heard any attempt to put a spin or ideology on it. It's simply scientists using scientific criteria to do a straightforward assessment. And here's IPCC's answer um, to this apples and oranges question. Here, what's been done, this is jargon, I'll translate it for you, is to, to uh, translate the effects of various possible um, factors on climate 
into a common language with common units. And the language radius of forcing means the effect on the energy balance of the Earth of a particular factor. So this says the increase in CO2 um, from pre-industrial until today has this uh, much effect it's on this scale here. It's about one and a half watts per square meter. It's as though you put a little one and a half watt Christmas tree light bulb over every square meter of the Earth's surface and let it uh, burn for 150 years. It takes a long time to heat things up, but it has a significant effect. And the other factors are uh, listed here. Uh, there, there is an attempt to squeeze too much uh, information, in my view, into too few figures. So there's a lot of numbers here. This, these quantify the length of the bars. This column over here, level, labeled LOSU. I have never met anybody who guessed LOSU. It's level of scientific understanding. Do you like that? <laughs> and so it's high for CO2 and less high for solar variability. So for example, the short answer to someone who says the sun is changing all the time and the sun in the past has been responsible for climate change is to say that is correct. But quantitatively, the sun's a more than a factor of 10 smaller in its, in its change, I said a tenth of a percent over the 11 year solar cycle compared to CO2, let alone the other um, greenhouse gases. So that we can quantify, as scientists like to do, the relative importance of these factors. I've summarized, and I'm not speaking here for the IPCC, I, the lawyers have asked me to say, I'm simply, I'm not trying to say anything inconsistent with IPCC, I think it did a marvelous job of scientific assessment, and I'm, uh, <coughs> I'm fully supportive of everything it has said, but I've extracted from the IPCC summary for policymakers a few uh, remarks on, that I think are especially pertinent tonight. Among the observational bits of evidence for climate change is that CO2 is growing more quickly now than it has in the past, that the Earth is now 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it was in mid-19th century. We expect hurricanes to get stronger. It's controversial. It's an area of active research, but a hurricane is a simple heat engine, and it uh, ought to uh, uh, get stronger on average as the uh, warm tropical ocean from which it derives its energy uh, gets warmer. And the data are uh, problematic, but the best data are in the North Atlantic, and there there is evidence that hurricanes have statistically significantly intensified in the last uh, 30 or 40 years. Uh, that's an area of active research today, many things still to be learned. We expect the Arctic uh, to warm more rapidly than elsewhere in general because of a feedback process. The snow and ice that cover the Arctic are melting, as you must know, and as they melt, they uncover darker ocean or land or plants below where the snow and ice were, and the darker surface below is in general less reflective and more absorbent of incoming solar energy. Just in the same way that on a, <coughs> on a summer's day, your feet get uh, burned on a black road, but they'll be less hot on a white sidewalk. And <coughs> the same thing goes in the Arctic. The Arctic works with this uh, feedback mechanism that amplifies and intensifies the warming it because the warming darkens the surface, which leads to more um, sunlight being absorbed. It's an interesting factoid that if you search for the 12 warmest years since 1850 is an arbitrary cutoff. Before 1850, there weren't really enough thermometers, widely spaced, well calibrated enough around the world to form a trustworthy, meaningful global average. It's an arbitrary date, but generally agreed on. If you look for the 12 warmest years in this 150 odd years, 11 of them are in the most recent 12 years. And the ocean, which has absorbed some 80% or more of the warming due to this, uh, <coughs> this factor, is warming not just in the surface, but uh, to depths of uh, about two miles. And that's true in all the global oceans. And we know that through, a, again, a remarkable uh, advance in observational technology. We, there are fleets of thousands of um, automated unmanned buoys floating around in the ocean today. They sink to a prescribed depth. They measure the temperature. They store it. After a while, they rise to the surface, uh, put up an antenna, call the satellite, radio the data in. It's really very remarkable. The IPCC predicts uh, in a funny way what will happen in the future. It doesn't make predictions so much as it, it does what if experiments, hypothetical or conjectural experiments. If people put greenhouse gases in, in the atmosphere, which depends on how many people there are, how we generate our energy, at a given rate in decades to come, what will the climatic consequences be? And <coughs> over that range of plausible, I, IPCC is not predicting uh, what humanity will do, but over this range of scenarios that were considered plausible. Uh, the sea level rise in the 21st century is in this range here, eight inches to two feet. 
I'm told that uh, the Netherlands is, is uh, planning on uh, a meter uh, or more as a safety factor when they consider strengthening and raising the dikes. But there are caveats. IPCC tries to give an accurate assessment of how certain the scientific knowledge is on, on a given point. What do we know with relatively great confidence? What with less confidence? What are the unknowns? What do we still have to work on? And uh, <coughs> one of the unknowns here is how ice sheets, that's a technical term, but there are ice sheets on, for example, Greenland and Antarctica as opposed to glaciers. And the dynamics of ice sheets is mysterious in many ways. And we know from paleoclimatic geological evidence that 125,000 years ago, when temperatures were comparable to those of today and those expected in the 21st century, uh, ice sheets uh, destabilized. Um, I'll show you an example of how that might have happened. And at that time, uh, sea level was much higher, up to 20 feet or so higher. But at that time, 125,000 years ago, nobody was around to take measurements. And we don't know um, <coughs> what the process was. And we know then that the high temperatures were sustained for centuries. So an unknown, to put it in a nutshell, is whether there's a danger of Greenland, for example, destabilizing, putting a lot of ice suddenly into the ocean, raising sea level catastrophically very rapidly whether that's likely to happen on a time scale of decades or, or whether it's going to take many centuries. And IPCC worked very hard on this issue. We read all the literature. We actually talked to all the experts. And it was very hard to find evidence there. Scientists are cautious. They don't like to go beyond the data. We're not analyzing conjectures or hypotheses or fears. We're analyzing results. And uh, so we simply said in the report, this is an area that, that bears watching that needs further research because the dynamics of ice sheets are not well enough understood to put accurate representations of them into the climate models or our calculations. The IPCC uh, also said that in the near term, regardless of the emissions scenario, we would see a continuation of the present day observed climate changes. Here's uh, Greenland. This is uh, not necessarily the most plausible scenario, but it's very photogenic. Uh, this is meltwater on Greenland tumbling down through a, a crevasse. These things are called moulins. And in some places, it's possible that melting water from the surface can fall all the way to the place where the base of the ice sheet is grounded on bedrock and lubricate it there, and thereby facilitate sudden calving of large masses of ice um, into the ocean. And uh, you can see this statement here. There's now much more is known about this, but this is a very active uh, area of research. As we speak, there are scientists on Greenland uh, with seismog <coughs> seism seismographic instrumentation studying ice quakes, and there's satellites measuring uh, the change in the mass balance from satellite optimetry and so on. This is Katrina, and I'd like to say very plain plainly here that Katrina uh, cannot be ascribed unambiguously to global warming. Uh, it is true, as I said, that in a warmer world, we'd expect a greater number of uh, intense hurricanes, and we see that statistically significant way in the North Atlantic, less so in other basins. But uh, it's best thought of as a change in the odds. The 100-year uh, storm may become the 10 or 20-year storm, um, or it may be more likely. The same uh, applies to heat waves, like the uh, 2003 heat wave in Europe that killed some 30-odd thousand people. Uh, you have to think of it as a change in probabilities. You have to think of climate statistically. Um, spending your vacations in Las Vegas will be helpful. <laughs> this is something designed to be very relevant to policymakers. And uh, it's uh, a figure you see here, 1900 on the left, the present sort of in the middle, 2100 on the right. And these are temperatures. They're in Celsius degrees. IPCC reports in, in Celsius. And I'm sticking to the original rather than recalibrating it for you. But multiply by 9 fifths, or about 2. So one way to read, these are different scenarios with these catchy names, A2, A1B. And uh, this one way to read this is to say that if you're um, emitting gases at an increasing rate as population grows and the developing world continues to develop on fossil fuels, especially coal, uh, then uh, you can expect temperature to rise along this path and peak out at somewhere between 3.5 and, and 4 degrees, 2100, but still rising. Uh, slower rates of emission produce slower temperatures. There is not much divergence in these uh, curves um, until, say, 2030 or one third of the way through the century. But by the end of the century, there's a substantial difference. Read backwards, if a policymaker can decide, as the European Union has, that two degrees Celsius relevant to the pre-industrial temperatures 
is uh, the maximum that can be tolerated, then this tells you that within a band of uncertainty that's assessed quantitatively, that's the amount of emissions that you can tolerate. So that's the IPCC being relevant to policy without being prescriptive of policy, summarizing the results of the research. And the same kind of data show up in a different format in this graph here. Here, the way to read this is that in each of these two columns, the top map is one of temperature change uh, <coughs> with the low emission scenario, the bottom one median emissions, and the top one high emissions. None of these scenarios assume any effort to reduce emissions. They're just uh, samples of how humanity might choose uh, to generate energy and, and uh, <coughs> might choose to uh, affect population. The darker the red, the greater the warming. And you can see that it, in the decade of the 2020s, which is this column here, uh, just as you didn't see the curve diverge very much from one another on the previous graph, here you don't see uh, drastic uh, differences between low, medium, and high scenarios. But by the 2090s, um, when uh, some of our children will be alive, you do see big differences. Uh, you do see uh, uh, a greater warming in the north, that's this Arctic amplification that I mentioned earlier, and in the high emission scenario, this uh, purple-violet area here is uh, uh, six or seven degrees uh, Celsius, uh, up in the 10 degrees uh, Fahrenheit range. And uh, there, all the Arctic seasonal sea ice is gone, the land is much warmer than the oceans, and there's strong warming everywhere. This um, is an altered climate, this is a different planet. If you translate this into effects on ecosystems, agriculture, and so on, it's a, it's a remarkable change. The same information is shown probabilistically over here. The different lines are different models. There's a, there tend to be extended tails on the high end, but uh, not on the low end. Here also is an IPCC uh, figure. Um, once again, I think the assessment is great here. There's still work to be done in communicating this most effectively. That's not an attack or to disparage IPCC. It's just to say that the teams of scientists that did this aren't equipped uh, to produce movies, textbooks, classroom materials, TV documentaries, and so on. But these are projected patterns of precipitation uh, changes in the coming century. Brown is less rain, blue is more rain. The stippled areas with these dots are ones where the model agreement is so strong that uh, the robustness of the result is greater. And you can see uh, this is uh, northern winter. I know that because I know that DJF means, stands for December, January, February. Does everybody else know that? I don't think so. This is northern summer, and you can see uh, that the areas of the great deserts become uh, drier in uh, both seasons, and there's more rain, um, more precipitation in general, at middle latitudes and higher latitudes. This is associated with changes in the dynamics of the atmosphere, the, the storm tracks, the paths followed by the migrating cyclones that you see on the TV weather maps, move away from the tropics and toward the poles in a warmer world. And we're already seeing evidence of this in, uh, in some observations. Okay. Um, I'll say a word or two about the mechanics of doing this. Once again, there's the IPCC website, which I commend to your attention. This report, this thousand page assessment of, uh, of the uh, physical science of climate change was written by and large by 150 odd people. There were 11 chapters. Each chapter has two heads. They're called coordinating lead authors. I'm one of them. The 150 people were chosen from 700 author nominations, mainly from governments, but also from other organizations. There was a lot of effort toward diversity as well as competence here. 25% of them were young in the sense that their PhD was less than 10 years old when they were uh, first appointed. 75%, including uh, myself, were IPCC virgins. We hadn't played any role in the previous report, and so we had no motivation to defend what had been said in the TAR, for example. And fully 35% uh, of the authors were not from the, the uh, wealthier developed countries where most of the research and nearly all the satellites and supercomputers are, but were from developing countries and uh, countries, as one says, with economies in transition, that is countries such as those in Eastern Europe and the former uh, USSR. And I can say from personal experience, it was wonderful having the perspective of, of these uh, people here, somebody from Bangladesh may not have a supercomputer in the basement at home, but they know a lot about monsoons and the effects of monsoons and the forecastability of monsoons and the importance to society of monsoons, for example. So it was a treat to have uh, this diversity. I, didn't, I know it's pedagogically not good to put 
tables up, especially in big auditoriums. So I'd bring this one up to call your attention to its existence, not to in the hope that everybody here can read it. But I'll tell you what it says. It's from the IPCC report. And what it uh, says is that for various levels of warming in this column here, this is in Celsius degrees, 2 to 2.4 degrees, 2.4 to 2.8 degrees, up to 6 degrees or so, um, that level of warming is associated with this much rise in sea level. So let's pick 2 degrees for concreteness. 2 degrees of, of warming relative to pre-industrial produces about 4 tenths of a meter of sea level, something between 1 and 2 feet of sea level rise. And if you want to limit global warming to that, the models say, with uncertainties that are spelled out in the report, that you want to have CO2 at about 350 parts per million. Mind you, it's upward to 380 today. And the other greenhouse gases converted to their CO2 equivalent in this range here. And to do that, given the lifetime of these gases in the atmosphere and the time scales of the biogeochemical cycles that determine the pathways in the climate system, you have to peak um, emissions uh, in the present period. This says 2000 to 2015. That's now. And then uh, you have to uh, be prepared to reduce uh, the emissions ultimately uh, to uh, more than 85% below 2000 levels. That means tokenism doesn't work. Tinkering at the edges doesn't work. To the degree that this science is trustworthy, and this is the best vetted definitive summary. The previous IPCC reports were approved by the National Academy of Sciences in this country, its counterparts in other countries, all the professional societies. This is solid mainstream science. There could be a Galileo comes along uh, and upsets some of it, but the fundamental physics here is so solid. The greenhouse effect's been understood since the 19th century. The first calculations were done in the 19th century, and they're within a factor of two of these, that it's unlikely you know, it's a long shot bet to say that there's going to be a major error in this. And that means essentially weaning the world from fossil fuels, basing the energy system much more entirely on other sources of energy, renewables, nuclear, and so on. Or finding a way to sequester the carbon to prevent the CO2 that's produced um, from uh, getting into the atmosphere. If you're willing to tolerate higher warming, then you can tolerate higher levels of gases. You can wait till, in this case, mid-century uh, to peak the emissions and start to decrease them. And uh, you can still end up with a higher emissions rate than today. But by so doing, you're looking at something in the 5 or 6 degrees Celsius, 9 or 10 degrees Fahrenheit, a range for global warming. That's the altered planet. So it's fairly, fairly sobering and fairly stark, but certainly relevant uh, to policy. Um, under the guise of a survey, I have snuck in a piece of research that I'm the last author on. This was a paper in Science last year in which we compared the observed rise in carbon dioxide and in temperature and in, uh, in sea level to previous projections. This uh, paper was submitted before the IPCC report was approved. Therefore, the projections are from the TAR and the earlier reports. And you can see that uh, CO2 is tracking fairly closely, the upper end of the projections. Uh, temperature, I'll show you a blow up of that in a minute at the high end, but CO2 at the very high end. Uh, here's uh, a picture with, of the temperature curve blown up with rec more recent data added. The red and blue solid lines here are smooth curves. The actual measurements are here. They go up and down a lot, even globally, because of phenomena like El Nino and La Nina. This, for example, is the very strong 97, 98 um, El Nino. So if you hear, for example, uh, somebody say, you know, global warming stopped in 1998. What they mean is that by arbitrarily choosing this point as their baseline um, and failing to notice that these subsequent years are just an extension of the previous variability, uh, that <coughs> in, in fact, uh, global warming has continued unabated, punctuated um, by short-lived episodes attributable to uh, El Ninos, which alter the heat balance between the atmosphere and the ocean. But this is at the high end of this dashed uh, family of lines here in the gray area, which are the IPCC projections. So we concluded that previous projections had not uh, exaggerated that. I'm going to say a few words in closing about policy now. Um, the uh, <coughs> IPCC is resolutely policy neutral. The IPCC will not attempt to say, you should turn to nuclear power for your electricity as France has done, or uh, you should uh, put in a carbon tax or put limits on fuel economy on cars. It simply tries to summarize the science in a way that's policy relevant but not policy prescriptive. 
but individual scientists can say what they like. And a number of us, of whom I'm one, uh, made a, a public declaration, widely publicized, uh, last year, before, just before the UN um, negotiations, which hold big 10,000 people annual events, uh, took place in December in Bali. And we went to Bali, some of us. I went to Bali in uh, December to publicize this declaration. And we said that in our opinion, as individual scientists, not speaking for IPCC or our employers or anybody else, um, we, uh, <coughs> uh, we advocate a, a limit of two degrees Celsius or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit above pre-industrial temperatures as a, a goal. This is a risk tolerance exercise. If your tolerance for risk is greater, you may be willing to accept a higher goal. But two Celsius or 3.6 Fahrenheit is already adopted by the European Union. 400 million people with an economy comparable in size to that of the US. And based on IPCC results, like the table I showed you, if you're going to get to 2 degrees C, you have to be prepared to cut the global emissions of greenhouse gases, CO2 being the most important one, but others being involved as well, at least 50% below 1990 levels, and to get it done by 2050. And that in the long run, the total greenhouse gas concentration has to be stabilized uh, at a particular uh, number here, converting all the other greenhouse gases, the apples and oranges thing, into CO2 equivalent units. And to do that, given the realities of, uh, as I said, biogeochemical cycles and so on, the lifetimes of these gases in the atmosphere, you have to peak and then begin to decline the emissions in the next 10 to 15 years. You no longer have the luxury of studying the problem while it gets worse. So that was a private opinion, but of a number of scientists, including some extremely eminent scientists, uh, at Nobel caliber people and so on. And now I want to say a few very personal things in closing. This is very much my own opinion. I'm not speaking for anybody else here. The question comes up whether scientists should be policy advocates. Should you go public with your policy uh, uh, convictions? And uh, does it damage, for example, your credibility as an objective research scientist to do that? Or ought scientists simply to stick to the lab and publish uh, technical papers and leave policy to policymakers and governing to, uh, to governments? I think some scientists uh, should, not all. Uh, some don't have the taste for it. Um, some are awful at it, and uh, it's an acquired skill, but there's different degrees of talent and enthusiasm for it. But I was very struck by a comment from the ozone uh, hole episode of the 1980s, which has many parallels and some differences with the current issue. Uh, Sherry Rowland, who's a professor at Irvine and who shared the Nobel Prize in 1995 for his work on the ozone hole, the chemistry prize, was quoted by a journalist. I'm often asked where, so I've put the exact citation down here. What's the use of having developed a science well enough to make predictions if in the end all we're willing to do is stand around and wait for them to come true? I feel that way. I called up Sherry Rowland and said, do you think that applies to the current global warming issue, which interests him a great deal? And he said, absolutely. You, know, you ought to make use of the science, and the science ought not to be used to, uh, to uh, make policy decisions. I agree fully with uh, Bill Buckley, who said famously that he'd rather be governed by the first 500 names in the Boston phone book than by the Harvard faculty, and I agree. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, sound science can help to, to inform wise policy. And I believe personally, having spent some time in this now, that among the important points are the first one, that science is uncertain, so is medical science, and that's not reason to ignore it. Medical science hasn't cured all disease, but you don't attack your physician at your, at your physical when you get advice on how to, how to live more sensibly, and you don't ask unreasonable questions, like, what date will my heart attack come? And, uh, and I think there are many parallels. I've written at great length on the parallels between uh, medical science and climate science. I think also that some of the things that everyone agrees ought to be done, the low-hanging fruit, so to speak, like improvements in energy efficiency and conservation, uh, don't have any downside. If you could trade your car today for, an, for a car that was identical in all respects except it got twice as good fuel economy, why not do that? Even if the climate scientists are all wrong, and this is a hoax, as Senator Inhofe has, has told us, then uh, nonetheless, you've put money in your pocket, you've improved the balance of payments, you've uh, reduced smog in Nashville, and uh, you've, uh, <coughs> you have many other, um, uh, many other benefits, collateral benefits. And uh, I think the ozone issue, as I said, was an example. The reason 
that the Montreal Protocol and subsequent agreements were signed, limiting the uh, manufacture and use of the chemicals that uh, we now know uh, destroy stratospheric ozone, is that science and government, public pressure, industry all got on the same page. And I think uh, also there's a kind of Hippocratic uh, oath uh, here that's relevant to, to science as well. I've become convinced personally, and I've begun to write about this, that there's an important role for uh, climate ethics and equity in these discussions, that uh, the science uh, can also help by producing results that uh, help bear on the questions that in the real world will get raised every time you, you ask uh, seriously how the world ought to react to this. The treaties that we're signatory to speak of the differentiated rights and responsibilities of developed versus developing uh, countries. And at Bali, you could hear uh, things like that all the time, which at the simplest, crudest level are the developing world accusing the uh, rich West of having caused the problem, which it did, and the West responding by saying, you're now producing uh, gases in increasing amounts. The, the increase in emissions is coming overwhelmingly from developing countries, which is true. China has passed the US recently as the single largest emitter of CO2. Both those things are true, but finger pointing, if it's left at that point, doesn't get you anywhere. There are interesting philosophical and almost metaphysical issues of the degree to which this, this is much more than an economic discounting problem, the degree to which we, uh, we have a debt to uh, our descendants. And I'm particularly leery of many proposals for geoengineering, which is the basket term for intentionally uh, interfering with the climate system. For example, by putting iron in the ocean to uh, spur the growth of plankton that will take up um, carbon dioxide, or by putting uh, particles or satellite parasols in the atmosphere to uh, shield us from sunlight in the hope that, um, that that cooling will somehow compensate for the warming. I think that aside from issues of technical feasibility and cost and legality, um, there are deep ethical issues of who has the right to make decisions like that on behalf of, of everybody. But I am convinced that in the real world, uh, progress to issues like this don't get made simply because scientists produce good data and then walk away. I think in addition to that, there are concerns of, of ethics and, and equity, and I think the, the uh, successful international agreements with which you can compare what we'd hope to reach on the climate front, uh, transboundary air pollution agreements, for example, um, or, or the ozone agreement. Um, many international agreements have explicitly recognized uh, uh, that. And finally, I think it's important to realize that the climate system is a global commons, and uh, nobody has the right on behalf of everybody to damage it. Um, polluter pays is a, a, a well uh, respected principle in, in law and in diplomacy. And I think that uh, the more strident advocates of, of geoengineering, the ones who, who think, why worry about this? We'll find a technological fix, are being uh, glib and need to think about the, the ethical implications and about what happens if it doesn't work or if it does work and we become addicted to it and it uh, helps some places and hurts other places, or most probably if it has unintended consequences. The bottom line is my statement there about nuclear war. war. It should be studied. It should not be tried. That's a personal conviction. I said I'd say a word about Dave Keeling, um, Charles David Keeling, known as Dave to his friends. And I want to speak in closing now to the young scientists here and to people who might be scientists and to underpaid, overworked grad students and postdoctoral fellows. It's okay to disagree with your boss when you're right. And <laughs> And science gets done by people who, uh, who are not overly worshipful of authority. When Keeling came to Scripps uh, with a chemistry degree in the late 1950s, having invented the instrument to measure CO2, Keeling was, um, as everyone who knows him will tell you, the most passionate, persistent, obstinate, obdurate, immovable person ever created. You would not want to be the concrete wall between Dave Keeling and where he wanted to be. And he wanted to measure CO2. Roger Revelle, a very distinguished scientist who was director of Scripps at the time, said Keeling had a gene for measuring CO2. <laughs> and that's what he did supremely well. And he fought with Revelle over how to do it. Revelle said, for example, at one point, well, you're an oceanographer. Welcome to Scripps. We'll put your instrument on ships, do a cruise, measure CO2 around the world, come back in 10 years, see if it changed. And Keeling said, with all due respect, Professor, Dr. Director Revelle, sir, you're crazy because what you ought to do is put the instrument in one place, a pristine location, 
CO2 will stay in the atmosphere so long that that one place will be representative of the whole world, regardless of where the CO2 is emitted. It gets mixed around by the winds. And that one continuous time series at one location with high quality data will teach you a lot more than parking my instrument on ships and driving them around the ocean once a decade. And he won. And that's a photo of the observatory on Mauna Loa during the International Geophysical Year in 1958. And at the bottom left is the first few years of the Keeling curve, by which time he had already figured out the rate of rise. Other scientists had predicted the rise we've seen uh, since then. He had analyzed the CO2 isotopically. He knew the source was, was fossil fuel emissions and deforestation. He had reasoned out the uh, reason for the interannual uh, variabilities. And he had kept it up. Uh, he kept it up all his life. He's now a great scientific uh, hero. But it was hard going, and there were many times when he struggled to keep this observatory funded. Uh, this is the Great Hall of the National Academy of Sciences in Washington. Um, that's the uh, on the right the uh, double helix. These are Darwin's finches, and that's the Keeling curve. These are some websites. I'll leave this up uh, in a minute, but first I wanted to remind you that this wonderful book, for which I wa have waived all royalties, uh, is on sale in the uh, lobby, and I'll be glad to sign it right after uh, the talk. Uh, so thank you very much. I believe Rick Chappell was going to moderate the questions, and I am uh, blinded by two searchlights, so I hope that's true. Can we bring the house lights up, please, and maybe uh, decrease these lasers that are directed at my eyes, please? Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant to, I meant to have that up there. Yes, you may. Except the, the system just froze again. So I'll reboot it, but while I'm doing that, um, I'll take a question, then I'll put the websites, the URLs for the websites back up in a minute. Okay, the, the question, if I may paraphrase, is uh, about the IPCC scenarios, these what-if experiments. The climate models were run with input to them being assumptions for several possible futures in terms of emissions and so on. They came from other parts of the IPCC, the parts involving social scientists, econom uh, economics experts, and so on, policy experts, who uh, simply laid out a, a number of possible futures. They've been criticized by people from those disciplines saying, I, expert A or B, can think of another plausible uh, scenario. But IPCC did not. Uh, Uh, did not uh, explicitly consider any of those scenarios as most, po most possible. Uh, the physical science part just said, we're not going to consider, we're not going to discuss which ones we think might be likely or what flaws there might be in them. And uh, I'm multitasking here. Um, I hope I don't bring up uh, my email to my wife or anything like that. <laughs> And uh, so I think the best way to regard them as simply what they purport to be, possible futures. And you can largely interpolate between them or extrapolate from the outside ones to get to other scenarios. And one of the considerations underway, this juggernaut never stops, and the planning is already going on for AR5. And the, there's extensive discussion going on now as to whether it's time to revise the scenarios and, uh, in, light of, uh, in light of subsequent developments. But I think the, the sensible way to regard them, regardless of what some media did, is simply to treat them for what they purport to be, possible 
uh, scenarios, illustrative examples, you might say, rather than predictions or projections of any kind. The question was about the slowing down of the North Atlantic Current. It hasn't slowed by 30% at all, and the, the North Atlantic uh, Current is the so-called meridional overturning circulation. It's the part of the ocean global current system that includes the Gulf Stream. And uh, the best estimates for models are that on a, on a mid-range scenario, that might slow by 25% over the course of the 21st century. And, but in no case does the Gulf Stream stop, for example, as it, as it might uh, over a much longer time period. The, um, the movie The Day After Tomorrow is wonderful entertainment and, and lousy, rotten science. You never know for sure, but uh, there are many ways in which these uh, models are tested and in which their predictions are compared with reality. I showed you some simple ones, looking at the IPCC projections of temperature and sea level versus the observations that have occurred. There are, that kind of, of comparison uh, is never uh, bulletproof because you're dealing with very short time scales. You'd ha like to have much longer record. The, can be errors in the data, there's natural variability to be accounted for, and so on. But these models have been tested in many, many ways. Firstly, they reproduce the observed simulation well. They reproduce regional variations. They reproduce seasonal uh, variations. They uh, are often able to say a lot about uh, the natural variability of the climate system. Uh, they reproduce the observed energy balance of the world, to which all this is extremely uh, sensitive. and. Uh, They've also been used in, you might say, inadvertent tests when uh, the vol volcano Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines went off, for example. As soon as the amount and nature of the material that were ejected into the high atmosphere was known, computer simulations were run. These were not hindcasts in which you could tweak uh, knowing the right answer. They were genuine forecasts made before the phenomena. They predicted global temperatures would decrease by about a degree over a period of several months and recover to normal over, over two or three years, which they did. So we know that a lot of the physics is independently tested. A lot of the physics that's, that's in the models is tested offline, you might say, phenomenologically against processes. But in the end, it's a question of expert judgment. I mean, nobody knows better than the modelers who work with these uh, huge codes uh, day and night for their whole careers that what the flaws are. And uh, in any program, I think, like that, you have to you have to have some expert judgment who can, which can say, this is more likely to be correct, this is more likely to be, to be incorrect. A lot of intermodel comparisons go on. The, the modeling groups of the world are now preparing to run the next generation of climate models with the next uh, uh, bunch of scenarios. So it's never perfect. It's a, it's a judgment call. And once again, the, the IPCC report is in no sense based entirely on models. The statement that the, uh, the recent warming uh, is most likely to have been, is like most of the recent warming is more than 90% likely, is supported by all kinds of other data too, by observational data, by analysis of paleoclimate data, and so on. So you're dealing with a totality of, of evidence here. And I think if you look in detail at the report, you, you see that very clearly. That there is no, there's no uh, single uh, arrow in the quiver, you might say, uh, that uh, on which the report hangs. That's an interesting question. The question was about bifurcations or instabilities or in, in everyday language, uh, tipping points or thresholds, forks in the road. Uh, 
where the climate system uh, leaps from one regime to another quite suddenly and, and, and seemingly unpredictably. And we know from paleoclimatic evidence, from the geological record, that that has happened in the past. And in some sense, it's inherently unpredictable because you're dealing with some tiny threshold. It's like the light switch, you push and push and push, nothing happens, old-fashioned spring-loaded light switch, and then slight push more and it clicks over into the other position. So that all we can do is warn about those things, summarize the kinds of things that have happened in the past, the circumstances under which uh, they occurred, model and simulate them the best uh, we can. But that's in large measure what I mean when I talk about risk tolerance. The statement uh, that you'll tolerate two degrees of warming above pre-industrial temperatures is, and if one person says that and another person says, I can live with three or four degrees, that's a subjective judgment, a non-scientific judgment on the likelihood of, of, uh, of that kind of thing. But the climate system does often behave like a switch rather than a dial, and the, the heavier you kick it, the more likely you are to bring one of those uh, uh, thresholds or bifurcations in, into play. We know about several of them, and I'd be shocked if uh, there weren't others that we don't know about. So you run a risk. What? I see. Yeah. Okay. I, I understand your question. But if I can um, shorten the question a bit, the, the question began with the statement that weather is chaotic and it's hard to uh, predict um, in advance and uh, you can't predict it at, uh, at long range. And when you're predicting uh, climate, is it possible that there's a bandwagon effect? Yes, it's possible that there's a bandwagon effect. If you got a result with your climate model that was greatly at odds with uh, what the community is getting, um, you might be uh, tempted to look for an error in your code rather than, to, uh, rather than to publish it. I don't think there's a strong bandwagon effect. I think that the very nature of science mitigates against that very strongly. There's nothing any scientist would like to do better than to have a stunning, striking, solid new result that overturns accepted uh, conventional wisdom. And uh, I think a lot of people are trying to do exactly that rather than to be conformist, um, whether you think that or not, I do. And, uh, and I also disagree with the premise of your statement about weather prediction, which I think is quite unfair. There have been extraordinary advances in weather prediction over the time period that I'm talking about. Uh, forecasts for several days in the future are as good now as one day forecasts were not so very long ago. We've extended the practical range of skillful forecasts by improvements in computer models, improvements in observational technology, improvements in theory. And uh, these may not matter much to the man on the street, but they matter enormously to the weather sen sensitive sectors of the economy. And climate itself turns out to be, as far as we know, very largely in mathematical terms, a boundary value problem, that we're predicting the statistics of an event so that we know that it's, it's impossible in principle to predict whether there'll be a, a thunderstorm in Paris at uh, 4 o'clock on, on next Christmas Day. But that doesn't say that we won't have skill in predicting whether Western Europe next winter will be cooler or warmer or wetter or drier than usual. And there is uh, some skill at seasonal forecasting like that. But it seems very likely that the nature of the kinds of climate predictions we're making here uh, for decades into the future rely heavily on, you might say, the external forcing of the system, the, the amounts of CO2, the strength of the sun, and so on, rather than the internal dynamics of the atmosphere. That's our best current understanding. Might it be wrong? Yes. But um, I don't think the likelihood of that is strong enough that one ought to essentially bet the future of the planet on the conviction that it's wrong. This s historians of science who have studied this issue say it's remarkable to find the degree of agreement in a scientific field on a complex active issue of research like this that you do find in climate science. And I personally prefer to think of that as, as research progress rather than any, any kind of pressure to conform. I don't see that pressure to conform in the proposals I review, for example. I see the usual 
wonderful array of people who'd like to disprove conventional wisdom. With that, I think we probably ought to stop. I'm going to, as soon as I pack the computer up, go out uh, to the lobby and uh, sign uh, some books, and I'll stay around and be happy to answer questions. And I highly recommend these uh, websites uh, to you all. Thank you so much. Thank you.